I just love New York so much. I think there's no more interesting place in terms of the kind of energy that's sparkling around you all the time. Walking is another way of getting out of yourself in the best possible way, because you really do get swept away by what's around you. And I always like nature near a cafe. That to me is the perfect nature. So I'm so delighted then I can get off, you know, I can walk off a path and be in a cafe in five minutes. That's always very reassuring. I think that every person you talk to is eccentric, deeply eccentric in their own way. You just have to find it. Some people are not as willing to show it, which is why New York is so fantastic, because people are uber willing to show any eccentricity they possibly can. And that's one of the points of being here is that you've left the restrictions of whatever place you've been in, you go, now I'm really going to show you something. When I was a child, I had a rich interior life, a lot of daydreaming and a lot of just observing. Daydreaming is a function of the brain that's an uncensored, exploration without controlling it of ideas and emotions. Often the best ideas, the smartest ideas, the most amazing ideas come from those moments when you're not trying. Somewhere along the way I understood that I needed to tell a story and I liked telling it in an episodic way that was kind of trying to find, first of all, the reason for being alive. Small thing like that. Why am I here? I'm here to write. And then, what am I writing about? Usually, I gravitate towards something that's funny and something that gets to the essence of not knowing what's going on. I probably have some of the sense of humor of my mother and my aunts, who were very irreverent. Came from Russia, they told very funny stories, and they were very kind of uh, honest and ridiculous at the same time. I often start my lectures with a photo of my mother, Sarah, and then I show the map that she made of the United States. And here it is. And the reason that it's so important to me is because this is a beautiful example of the brain and the mentality of the woman that was really the most important person to me and the strongest influence on me. So of course, she makes it into an egg shape and uh, Florida is over here, Hawaii is over where New York should be. New York is a swath of New York State. She has Tel Aviv and Lenin in there from her village in Poland. Tel Aviv, where she, where she moved to in Jerusalem. And other various ridiculous things on the, on the West Coast. And through the center, she has, sorry, the rest unknown, thank you. And so this map is a perfect example of really not caring about getting it right. It's really caring about just having some kind of wonderful encounter with knowledge. When I walk up the stairs into the Metropolitan Museum, I feel a sense of electricity, anticipation, elation, and I feel very large and very small. I like to go on Friday night or Saturday night when it's open late. It's really an incredible place to go on a date if you happen to be with somebody who likes to sketch. And fantastically romantic. And I often come just by myself and just spend time doing whatever I, you know, sketching or hanging out or just looking at people. So I was invited to do a, a talk at the TED Met and my theme was relating epic moments in my life to acquisitions at the same time at the Met. So I started basically in 1954 and remembering my mother wearing her giant bra to fry different foods in the kitchen. She'd wear a giant bra with her towel tucked on it. At the same time, the Met acquired Vijay Lebrun's painting of the Comtesse de Bonton in fantastic finery with silk and, and ribbons and a tremendous hat and 
you know, it's just completely the opposite of my mother shopping at Klein's for her $4.99 bra. Copying is my way of learning, and when I copied the Bernard, I realized how extraordinarily difficult it was. Of course, everything, that, everything that's fantastic looks so simple, and it's fantastic to immerse yourself in somebody else's painting and then try to do a copy of it, which I thought was, you know, not bad. Creating colors is probably one of the most instinctual parts of painting for me because I'm mixing and then I'm mixing and then I'm finding the right color and the sense for me of what has memory, what has light, what's telling the narrative, what colors that I just love. I don't, I, I don't know if people are born with a sense of colors that they love and they gravitate towards. For me, it's finding the naturalness of myself. I like to think of myself as a journalist or an illustrator at large. And the reason I use the word illustrator is because I wouldn't ever want to be in the position of being given a studio and somebody opening the door and say, here, go in and do something. I think that that would paralyze me. What I need is an assignment and something, something concrete to hold on to. And then I do it the way I want to do it. That gives me great pleasure. And, and in that way, I'm a reporter just telling you what I've seen. I'm doing a book with MoMA, Girls Standing on Lawns, based on my collection and their collection of photographs. This project came about because I collect a lot of photographs from flea markets and realized that I was collecting a lot of photographs of girls standing on lawns. And I've worked on a few books with Daniel Handler, who's AKA Lemony Snickets. And I sent him the photographs and I said, what do you think? Maybe you could write something. Immediately he wrote something really tender and funny about all of us standing here in life, what, you know, not knowing what to do with our hands. And snapshots and vernacular photographs are part of that great human expression of why are we here? How are we documenting it? The heyday of vernacular snapshot photography really started in 1888 when Kodak introduced the Kodak number one camera. So thanks for coming back. There are certain photographs that lend themselves obviously to my sensibility as something there's a sense of humor or a sense of dreaminess, like the Alice in Wonderland scene of these, this, this group of people in costume on the lawn. And it's just completely speaks to me because we always are in that in-between world of, you know, is this, a, is this a dream? Is this really happening? Are we in costume? What are we, you know, who are we? What I love is the way you manage to take every little one of these borders and just, even when they're totally plain, include them. Here's our cover girl. The reason we had settled on her as the first one in the sequence, I think, Myra, was because you really, you liked her, her aura. I fell in love with her, and there is such a, a kindness there and a generosity of spirit in this kind of, you know, awkward, and, a, and an awkwardness. The way that I collect information is that I write a lot, and I try to find the interesting bits in the narrative that I've created and end up with something that's crisp and unsentimental, but has emotion in it and has uh, some kind of, you know, uh, sense of optimism. But something that's really stripped there and, is, and has a modernism to it, but also has a Baroque swirl around it. Anyway, I'm trying to get within the, the moments, inside the moments, inside the moments. So I've been friends with Isaac Mizrahi for a very long time. And he knows, or I think he knows, that I've always had this unrequited desire to be on stage. He asked me to be the duck in his production of Peter and the Wolf, which is gonna be at the Guggenheim Museum. Peter and the Wolf was written by Sergei Prokofiev, who was a Russian composer in 1936, and it's meant to be an introduction to the orchestra for children. 
And each animal in the story is a different instrument. So the duck is an oboe, the bird is a flute, etc. So the choreographer for, the, for Peter and the Wolf is John Higginbotham, and he is incredible. He was a dancer with Mark Morris, and now he has his own company. We have to begin by saying that he is the kindest person on earth. We have a, a very interesting and varied cast. Some of our cast members are professional dancers, and some of them are not. And so the key is to make the whole production make sense, but coming from a lot of different um, points of view. The costume that Isaac designed for me is a big tutu that goes up in the back like a duck's ass, glasses with a duck nose, and a kerchief, a little babushka. It's, it's life is dangerous and you go waddling on. Well, I've been reading Peter and the Wolf at the Guggenheim for the past six years, and I've been reading it and kind of envisioning how I would set it if I were to set it, right? And somehow, like, reading it across the street from Central Park, like, it just occurred to me that it was actually taking place in Central Park. And so the whole idea of the zoo and Central Park, it just kind of makes a lot of sense to me, you know, on a lot of different levels. And I also think the music is so incredible and so theatrical and so danceable. For me, Myra has always been a kind of like touchstone. He's very opinionated, right? And somehow I think of the duck in that way too. The duck is truly an opinionated girl, right? And I just love the elegance that Myra brings to this, you know, because the duck can be a caricature. The oboe is a reed instrument. And I mean, I don't think it's by accident that, you know, um, that just the application of the lips to the actual mouthpiece of the oboe, kind of, you know, it, feel, it feels like a duck, right? Well, I have to say that, uh, you know, I, I probably was a duck in another life because it feels so natural. I've waddled, I've waddled for many years, and so uh, I feel, you know, terrified, diva-ish, the way a duck does feel. Quack, the end. <laughs>